Yes, it is. Amen. If you have your Bible, turn to the book of Acts with me tonight, please. Chapter 6. The book of Acts, chapter number 6, and verse number 1. Acts chapter 6, and verse number 1. <clears throat> the scripture says, In those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews, because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Then the twelve called the multitude of the, of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Procurus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. Father, bless your holy word now. Thy name I pray. Amen. You can be seated. By this time, the church had grown by its thousands. Thousands had been added to the church of God. And the Hebrews and the Grecians, of course, represent two totally different cultures. Completely, totally different cultures. In the northern part of Israel, a place called the area around Galilee, the Sea of Galilee, was an area called Decapolis. And that literally meant the ten cities. That's the word deca in, uh, in Greek means ten, polis is city. And it had a Grecian culture. And therefore it was in odds uh, with a lot of went on in Jerusalem and the more orthodox of the Jews. So there was an issue there. And when the church of God began on the day of Pentecost, if you remember, 16 different people, nationalities were there. They heard the word of God. And then as it continues, you'll see how God in Acts chapter number 10 takes the apostle Peter to the house of a Gentile, Cornelius, a centurion, and lets them know without question that Gentiles now make up, along with the Hebrews, the body of Christ. And so therefore, there is no more sectarianism. There shouldn't be that in the body of Christ, that the Hebrews and the Grecians should receive the same type of treatment and the same uh, love and respect and and incorporation into the body, and problems arise. We have all these, uh, these widows, apparently, and there's a daily ministration. They're taking care of the widows. The church has always been one to feed people when they're hungry and to take care of the poor. That's been the history of the church for 2,000 years. But an issue arises, and what happens? Well, you have 12. Notice it calls them the 12. Even when we have the one over there in the book of Acts, chapter number 1, who replaced Judas Iscariot, he was considered one of the 12. So the 12 is a term for the 12 apostles, the original apostles of the Lamb. Now an apostle's a big deal, folks. It's a big deal. It's one who is sent forth with a commission and power and authority by the hand of the Son of God himself. And notice carefully they said that we, uh, we have more important things to do. It's not that what needs to be done doesn't need to be done, it certainly does. But we have more people, as you remember the case of Moses, he sat all day long uh, worrying with the problems of the people and they counseled him and said, why don't you set people over captains and, and so forth and let them handle this business and you continue with what you've been called to do. And this comes up to us here in uh, the book of Acts chapter number uh, 6 where it says plainly that we should give ourselves to the ministry of the word of God. And that's very important, the ministry of the word of God. And uh, if, a, if a person uh, takes upon themselves to preach from the pulpit, then they should be willing to engage in the ministry of the Word of God because there is more to ministering to people than simply speaking from the pulpit. But in East Tennessee, we've got preachers by the tens of thousands, and all they do is preach, and if they're not pastoring a church, they don't even go. I hope you heard me out there. I hope you did because you've preached to people about being faithful to the church, and now here you lay around and don't go. Your, did you hear me? You need to be in church, because the people that you pastored at one time and preached to them, they're watching you now. 
well, I don't preach anymore. Oh, you are preaching. Did you hear me? <laughs> you are preaching by your lifestyle. You see, the thing about a minister is that his integrity is everything. And if he has no integrity, he has nothing. And that's very important to understand. But we start here in the book of Acts chapter number 6 with what's called deacons. Now, a deacon is a servant. He's someone who is ordained, set aside to fulfill a specific purpose in the church, a needful purpose, a purpose that once he's done that, he should be held in high esteem and respected. Deacons are people that people love and they respect them because they're there for them when they need them. And they're able to do the things and allow the minister, and we'll get into them in just a moment, but we'll deal first of all with a deacon. And they allow the, the, the elders and the bishops to be able to do what they need to be doing in the direct ministry of the word of God and prayer. So what we have here in the book of Acts chapter number six are seven men full of the Holy Ghost chosen by the church to be deacons. Now note carefully the number of the ratio. We have thousands of people that are saved. The church is thousands. Nobody knows exactly how big this church was, but it was huge. And they chose seven men. So the ratio essentially would be something like a, a thousand to one, one deacon to a thousand people. But it's a very good thing. It's an honorable thing. It's a blessed thing. It's the kind of thing that a person who does the office of a deacon should be respected highly because they've given of themselves and they've served uh, in the church of God. The Greek word deacon is literally a transliteration of the Greek. Of the, uh, the English word deacon is a transliteration of the Greek word diakonos. Now, what's a transliteration? Well, if I took the word diakonos and translated it into English, I could say servant. That's a translation. But if I take the word diakonos and just take it over into English and anglicize it, we get deacon. And that's what we have today. It's untranslated, but it means a servant. Now, here's what the lexicon says about it. A minister, servant, deacon. The derivation is uncertain. According to some, it comes from diakonos in the dust laboring or running through dust which would be the etymology, but others derive it from diako, the same as dieko, to hasten, related to, to pursue. In plain words, a servant, someone who is conscious and working to serve the people that needs to be served in the church, a very important thing. Also used in the New Testament is a technical term side by side, now listen carefully, with episkopos. We'll get into episkopos in a moment, which is a bishop or an overseer. The deacons in this sense were helping or serving the bishops or elders. And this is why they were probably called deacons. They did not, though, possess any ruling authority as did the elders. Now keep that in mind. They were not placed to rule and take authority over people. They were there to serve the people and earn the respect and love of the people when they were doing what God had called them to do. So the best, what you would say tonight of a deacon is he's someone who should be beloved and someone should be respected and someone who has been called and been ordained because you lay hands on them and set, aside, set them aside and put them into that aspect, to that part of the ministry. You see, the church has a lot of different needs, a lot of different needs and far more needs than, than one pastor could ever see to. And you don't want people to go without, uh, you know, where they, if they have need, they need, to be, they need to be taken care of. And so this is what we, we are looking at. The qualifications, it says in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 8, says, Likewise must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre. Verse 10, and let those first be proved, then let them use the office of a deacon, being found blameless. Verse 12, let the deacons be the husbands of one wife, <clears throat> not a husband of a husband, right? They won't get it. Let the deacons be the husband of one wife, ruling their children and their own houses well. And verse 13, For they that have used the office of a deacon well purchase to themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. I do believe that God looks down in love, special love, to his servants in the church, the men who are set aside as deacons. So, Temple Baptist Church needs to do some praying, doesn't it? About God laying his hand on certain people and being set aside. And that's what's important, that they may be set aside and uh, prayed over and prayed about uh, as deacons. 
Now we need to learn something tonight because this is important. This is very important. In 1 Peter chapter number 5 and verse number 1, if you'd like to turn there, here's what the apostle, the apostle Peter. Now, by the way, I might add this tonight. This is my opinion. <clears throat> but I do not believe that these people who call themselves apostles are apostles. Amen. They don't be mean. I don't want to make anybody mad. But I do not believe they're apostles. I do not believe it. I do not believe it. I don't accept that. But in 1 Peter chapter number 5 and verse 1, the elders which are among you I exhort. Now listen to what Peter said of himself. Who am also an elder. Now the word elder could refer to an aged man. Could refer to an aged man, certainly. And the church should have respect for the aged, aged people. They should have. And, uh, and by showing respect, you show respect for yourself. If you don't respect anybody, you don't have any respect for yourself. And you should understand that that's, that's a simple thing of character. But the Apostle Peter said, he said, who am also an elder. Now, see, he wanted them to understand that even though he was an apostle, an apostle. You wouldn't think that an apostle would necessarily feel like that he would need to be an elder. But the truth of the matter is, when the apostle ministers the word of God, he's an elder. Now, watch the, watch the connection. He said, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that should be revealed, feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, you shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Now, folks, I read Peter, First and Second Peter, all the time. It, I don't know why. Now, I read other scriptures, of course, but I love Peter. Because he has a practicality about his, about his epistles. There's just something practical about him. And the, and the revelation that God had given to the apostle. So what is the qualification of an elder or bishop? Okay. Now look at Titus chapter number 1. And I want you to see the connection between the two. Titus 1 verse 5. I want you to look at it now. How this is used in scripture. In Titus chapter number 1, in verse number 5, For this cause I left thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, now watch this, and ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. Now watch the text. If any man be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly, for a what? See how interchangeable elder and bishop is? In the same breath, because he starts talking about the elder who could also be a bishop. So he continues, a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God, not willed, self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine. No striker, not given to filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. So we have here set before us elders and bishops. In the, in the simple sense of the word, every bishop is an elder, every last one of them. I'm an elder tonight. I'm an ordained elder in the church of God, but I'm also a bishop. And that needs to be understood because I'm a pastor of a local assembly of believers. All elders, ordained elders, are not necessarily pastors. So when a man takes the office and responsibility of pastor, then he becomes a bishop in the sight of God. And this is why the term is interchangeable, because a bishop can certainly be an elder, certainly is an elder, and an elder can certainly become a bishop. Now, God gave elders, bishops, and deacons to the church for a reason. And that reason is that the church should not be lacking or wanting in anything as it ministers to the people who come to that church. Now, you know, you have your life, your family, and that's all good. And you may be going through a good time tonight. That's good. Hallelujah. Shout with you. But sometimes you're going through a dark valley. And when you get into that dark valley, I'll cry with you. And I'll pray with you. You see, uh, in my identity tonight to you, I am a bishop in the church of God. And I'm going to ask you a question tonight, and we'll move along. But I just want to ask you a question. Why don't the Baptists use the term bishop? They're so scriptural. If the Bible says it, it says it. 
Show me one verse in that Bible that says not to use the term bishop. Well, you say other denominations use it in the wrong way. Well, maybe they do. The sodomite uses the, what? The rainbow. But that doesn't stop us from using the rainbow. And of course, their rainbow has more stripes and it's not the same, but it's still from a distance. Someone didn't know the difference. They'd think that uh, essentially, if we put our rainbow up in Bible school or something for the kids, oh, this is an LGBTQ people's church, huh? No, it's not. This is the church of God. And if you're an LGBTQ, you're welcome to come, sit in the pew, and we'll preach to you. But you won't be a Sunday school teacher. You won't get up in the pulpit and preach and teach to people. You certainly won't stand up and give your testimony. You have none. But you are welcome to come. You're welcome. Because if you don't get the word of God here, who are you going to get it? You're not going to get it from Caesar. No, you're going to get it in his house. Amen. So the qualifications of an elder or bishop are pretty stringent. Uh, in 1 Timothy 3, verse 2, a bishop must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. Now, I might mention this to you tonight for those that may not know. I was confronted by a man about 40 years ago out here in the foyer. He wasn't a church member. He came from somewhere else. We have activists like that, of course, by the way. I didn't know him from Job's Turkey. But he showed up out here in the foyer, and he said, he said, you know, you're really not qualified to be a pastor. I said, how come? He said, well, when you were in the Navy, you were married, and now you're married to a different woman. I said, well, son, I was never in the Navy. So whoever told you that, they, told, they lied to you, and now you're perpetuating a lie. You bought into it because you heard one side. That's right. You didn't hear both sides. Let me say this tonight, and I'll be kind. If, all, if you base your life and your entire life on one side of a story, you're stupid. Amen. And you can't do anything for stupid. You can educate ignorant, but you can't do anything for stupid. There's always two sides. And I said to that man, well, you're wrong. You're dead wrong. The woman I'm married to now is the only woman I've ever been married to. I, got, I married to her in 1966. This December will be married 57 years. Okay. And I was not in the Navy, and there's nothing wrong being in the Navy. I have some best friends in the world were in the Navy. No problem with that. But I was not in the Navy. I was in the Marine Corps, which is connected, a department of the Navy. Yes, in that sense it is. But he was wrong. But he, it didn't bother him to get in my face and tell me I wasn't qualified to be a pastor all those years ago. See how it goes? Yeah. Now, that's the sad thing. Don't ever let yourself get sucked into something like that. God gave you a brain. Use it. Use it. Yes, use it. But in any event, the qualifications, he must be blameless. A bishop must be blameless. Integrity is everything for a bishop. It is. It's everything. Now, I used to work as a professional mechanic. I could lay out and get drunk the night before. I mean, falling down drunk and get up the next morning with a hangover and a headache and go to work and jerk wheels off, do valve jobs. No big deal. Didn't bother me one bit. Not one bit. Why? Because I wasn't ministering the word of God. I wasn't preaching and teaching, and I wasn't saved. That's the difference, folks. I had no integrity. I was an unsaved man. I lived for myself, just like every other unsaved man does. I lived for myself. I didn't care anything about anybody but me. Did you love yourself, preacher? Oh, I love myself with a passionate love. You never loved yourself near as much as I love myself. I've heard some of these preachers that think they're preachers that get up in the pulpit and tell people you need to love yourself. Folks, self-love is not what you need. Love for Christ is what you need. Not self-love. Not self-love. The Bible says no man ever hated his flesh. But in any event, the elders that are ordained in every city, they're necessary. So what is that? That is a man that is qualified by years of study, prayer, and fellowship with the Lord to be able to teach to be able to minister, to be able to feed the people. And a church, if it has any kind of a real organization to it, should have elders in it. It should have men in there that are mature men who have learned and uh, commit thou to faithful men, the Bible says, who are able to teach others also. They're able to teach. They're able to minister. They may do it through a Sunday school class. They may do it through uh, fellowship meetings and so forth. But they're able to teach. They can minister the word of God. One of the first qualifications of a pastor is apt to teach. To teach, to teach. I had a person tell me here at Temple about 45 years ago up in the other building before we ever built this one. They told me, they said, oh, our former pastor, he was a preaching machine. 
But now he couldn't teach. He said, he told us, he said, pastors don't have to teach. What they need to do is preach. And that's what they told me. Well, bless their heart, I'm sure they still, I don't know if they still believe that or not, but that's dead wrong. Say, so why? Because a pastor is responsible for what's taught in that church. And if he doesn't know the Bible, then he doesn't have qualifications to pastor that assembly. And that's what's important about it. Now, I want you to notice something that's connected with a bishop or with an elder that is never connected with a deacon. What is that? Well, it's this. In 1 Peter chapter number 5 and verse number 2, it says, Feed the flock of God which is among you. Now, watch this wording. Taking the oversight thereof. You see that? Now, go down to Hebrews 13 and verse number 7. Hebrews 13, verse 7. Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. Then in verse 17, Hebrews 13, Obey them that have the rule over you, and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls, as they that must give an account. Did you see that? As they that must give account. God's going to hold somebody accountable in here, for false doctrine if it gets preached or taught. Amen. He is. Who do you think he's going to hold accountable? Who do you think? Who's he going to come to? Who's next on the chop block? Yeah. Who? <laughs> How many believe it's me? It's exactly right. It's me. I'm responsible. And so therefore, it's necessary that I keep my nose buried in the book and I'm praying and I'm in fellowship with the Lord and I'm doing what God's called me to do and I should be able to note heresy quickly when it shows up. And that's what, uh, that's what this church is about. It's about being able to do that. But if you notice, it says rule over them, okay? Now look what Peter says in 1 Peter chapter number 5 and verse 2. Again, to feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, in other words, not forcefully, to constrain someone to put them in handcuffs or something, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. Now look at this. Neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. You see that? Their leadership is a gift from God, folks. It is. Believe me. Leadership is a unique gift. And so therefore, if a man desires the office of a bishop, he or certainly desires a good work, but he had better be a leader. A leader, you must be able to lead. Now, you don't drive sheep. I've never seen sheep driven. You can't drive them. They'll, they'll scatter. They'll disperse. You have to lead them. That means that the pastor or the bishop goes through the same problems, sorrows, times, places that the people do. He's not exempt from what the people uh, in the church have to live. He lives the same life in the same world. And so when I preach to you, essentially I'm preaching to myself also because the word of God is not me. I'm just simply a messenger sending it forth, but it applies to everybody in the house tonight. You know, and I've seen a lot in 47 years. I've seen some people suffer, folks. I've seen them lose a lot of things. I've seen, I've seen a lot of bad stuff happen. And so there's no reason for me to think that I'm exempt from any of that. If I'm going to pastor a church, then I'm, I'm going to, and the truth of the matter is, it should make the preaching more relevant to you to know that the man that's up here preaching to you is living what he's preaching. I don't want to hear somebody who doesn't live what he preaches. Exactly. I don't. I don't care about hearing him. And, uh, and it's important to understand that there's an accountability issue, and that is so important. I know a lot of people who like to authority, and they like to take authority. But if you backed them into a corner and say, all right, here's the authority, you take the responsibility now for the souls of these people. You'd see them crawfish like you wouldn't believe, you know, especially if they have any reverence for God. For, you know, you don't play with God. You don't play with him. So, <clears throat> and so what are you doing here? So what's going on? Well, it's this. We need deacons, we need elders, and we need bishops, all right? In order to have a pastor of a church, 
you, don't, you can only have one bishop who's the pastor of that church. You cannot have two pastors. Now, you can have pastors over different areas and functions in the church, youth pastors, so forth and so on. But when it comes to the pastor of that assembly, the one who's ultimately accountable, the one who's ultimately responsible, you can't have two heads. You, only, you have to have one. And the people should respect that because they should respect the fact that uh, if, if heresy is brought into the church, that it's the responsibility of that bishop to go directly to them and deal with that heresy when it comes in. But he should be learned enough, he should be read enough, well-read enough, taught enough to know heresy when he sees it. Yeah. And that's right. And that's, that's what I have to look for. I have to look for that because that's what I do. You see, the ministry of a bishop is prayer and ministering the Word of God. Now, for over a month, the Holy Spirit's been grieved inside this bishop, this pastor. And I've been living with this now. I've never had to go through quite a time quite like this one. It's been, it's been, a, it's been a trying, challenging time. And I feel sorry for some people who have made decisions based on emotion, based on half-truths, and not, uh, not knowing fully what's going on. <clears throat> That's sad. That's sad. I've always been the kind of person who likes to get to the bottom of what's going on before I get on board. <laughs> I want to know what's happened. What's going on? Wouldn't you? Yeah. Uh, Satan hates this church. Yeah. He hates it, folks. He hates it. Yeah. And he hates me. He hates me. He does. God has blessed Temple Baptist Church. I don't know how many people are watching right now, and I always say to them, you're welcome. God bless your soul. We're glad to have you. But I'm looking at you. I'm looking at the people sitting in this building, you see. I'm trying to minister to you tonight. And the first thing I would say to you tonight is that your pastor, the bishop of this assembly, must be a man of integrity. He must be. He must be. Because if I don't have integrity, if I'm a liar, if I'm a deceiver, if I'm a thief, or what, if I'm a profligate, if I'm, if I'm running around chasing women, if I'm a drunkard, or any of the rest of these things, I have no business up here in front of you. I have none whatsoever. I have none. I have no business. You don't pastor like that. And uh, I'm afraid that there's an awful lot of churches, though, where they don't hold that. They don't hold any, any character uh, like that, and they, they do as they please and so forth and so on, but not me. I don't know how much time I've got left in this world. I don't know. I don't worry about it. And I told the Lord the other day, I said, Lord, I don't know how much time I've got left, but don't tell me. <laughs> don't hear it. <laughs> I just as soon, <laughs> when you're ready for me, I'm, I'm here to get you today, okay? Here we go. <laughs> don't, uh, don't tell me six months from now, six o'clock in the afternoon on such and such a date, you're out of here. Good night, man. How much sweating would you do between now and then? Trying to get stuff straightened up and get this done, get that done. No, I think he's gracious with us. And, you know, we're leaving, I'm going, but I don't know when. And I'm, I like it like that. How many of you feel the same way about it? I think I, I thought so. <laughs> I thought so. So what do you do? You live your life with eternity in mind. You live your life knowing that you're going to stand at the judgment seat of Christ. You live your life, you live it for the Lord, and you live your life with that blessed hope. And the blessed hope, what is that blessed hope, by the way, anybody? Anybody know what that? That's right. That's exactly right. It's called the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior. What's that? That's the rapture of the church of God. Amen. It's when he comes to get us. It's a mysterious thing. The father's the only one that knows. He hadn't even told the son. The father knows when he's going to come and get us. And that's good enough for me. Amen. That's good enough. But until then, until then, by the grace of God, I will, by the grace of God, retain my integrity. Because my integrity is everything, folks. It's everything. If I lose it... You'll see me resign this church so fast you'll feel the vacuum as I go out that back door. Amen. Amen. If, I, if I lose my integrity, it's, it, uh, then I'm finished. I'm done for. And I'll fade off into the, uh, as MacArthur said, old soldiers don't die. They just fade away. Well, I'll fade away and I'll be gone. So pray for me tonight that I retain my integrity, that you can trust me, and that when I get up and preach the word of God, I preach it from a heart that believes it. And I need your prayers. I need your prayers because Satan has tried to sift me like wheat. I'll have good times and bad times. I'll have times when I get mad. And, uh, and, and, you know, Paul got mad. Moses got mad. You can get mad and still love the Lord. But you can't go around mad all the time. Because you do that, you're going to grieve the Holy Spirit. 
You got to get out of your mad spell. And I have times of joy and rejoicing. And it's been that now. It's been, it's been back and forth, swinging both ways, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And so I beg you tonight, please remember me in prayer because I've got this Sunday coming up and, uh, and I'm supposed to preach both services Sunday. And I thank God tonight for Rock Collins like you would not believe. Oh, man. If you weren't here Sunday, you missed some of the best preaching you're going to hear anywhere. I mean, that man's a preacher. And God sent him for me. I don't know about you, but he sent him for me. I mean, he ministered to me. And I praise God for it. But I ask you to pray for me. That I, that, 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 you see, I know this and you should know this. The Spirit is everything. It's everything. The Holy Spirit needs to be free in my soul. There needs to be a freedom there. There needs to be a receiving to go out on that porch at 4 and 5 o'clock in the morning and sit out there and look up at those stars and have God begin to speak to you and the Spirit of God move in your soul. Amen. It's a wonderful thing. But it's been two days since I've been able to do that. But I've been doing that now for four weeks uh, in particular with what's going on. And God's been speaking to me. He's been helping me. So please pray for me that this coming Sunday that I'll have what God wants me to preach. But most of all, pray for me this coming Sunday that I'll have freedom of the Holy Spirit of God. Folks, I've been at this way too long to think that I can get up here and stomp around and preach God's word in the flesh and yell and scream. That's not preaching. You need unction. You need the Holy Ghost. And if you don't know what that is, get the videos and go back and watch this man that preached this past Sunday. And you'll get it right there. You'll get a hold of a man that was under the power of the Holy Spirit and just old-fashioned, old, good old-fashioned, rare back and preach. Amen. There's nothing like it, is there? How many enjoyed him there Sunday? Good night. I think everybody loved him. I certainly did. And, uh, and uh, as soon as we can, we're going to try to get him back here and get him to come back and preach to us again. Amen. I don't know about you, but I need preaching. I need somebody preaching to me. Amen. I love to hear God's word preached. All right. So I hope I said something tonight, something that's useful, something beneficial. I hope I did. I see myself now in the latter years of my life. If you ask me who and what I am, I'll tell you I am a bishop in the church of God. That's who I am. That's what I am. Amen. And if your Baptist brethren feel uncomfortable by using that terminology, ask them why. Amen. Amen. And you'll see them clam up like a clam out here in the ocean. Does anybody have a prayer request tonight? Yes, sir.